friends, as we come to the fourth chapter of the book of Romans, we're still in this great section of justification by faith. We've had the doctrine that's been given to us. And that, by the way, has been important. This whole section in here that we are in is the justification of the sinner. Paul states very vividly and clearly that man is a sinner. And he reveals then that God provides the righteousness for sinners. And then this justification by faith is explained. We've just come through that section. Now we have justification by faith illustrated. And the illustrations that are given to us are twofold. Abraham, we'll see him first. He was justified by faith, and he was before the law was given. Then we have David, who was under the law, yet justified by faith. Now, Abraham and David, in Paul's day, were probably held in higher esteem by the nation Israel than any other two that are recorded in the Old Testament. Now, I recognize that is not true at the present. I noticed that there was a debate among rabbis several years ago about who was the greater in the Old Testament. Was it Abraham or Moses? And they left David out altogether. And I never did get the final decision, but it seemed to me from the news account that I read that more were in favor of Moses than even of Abraham. But certainly that would not be true even today, of the Orthodox Jew. He goes back to Abraham. He boasted in the fact, and still does today, that Abraham is our father. And he's quite accurate about that. And then you'll remember that in our Lord's day, he asked the question. He says, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They said unto him immediately, He's the son of David. I think they, in that day, would assume that the two great men of the Old Testament that were the outstanding ones would be, of course, Abraham, the founder of the race, and also David, the great king. Now, Paul uses these two Old Testament worthies as illustrations to establish his statement in the last chapter that there is concord and agreement between the law and the gospel although they represent two diametrically opposed systems. Neither contradicts nor conflicts with the other. They are not mutually exclusive. Even under the law and before the law, faith was God's sole requirement, and Abraham before the law was justified by faith, and David under the law, he sang of justification by faith. Paul is not presenting some strange new doctrine which cancels out the Old Testament and leaves the Jew afloat on the sea of life, holding on to an anchor rather than being in a lifeboat. Paul is showing that Abraham and David are in the same lifeboat, which he's offering his own people in his day and his label, justification by faith. The law was a pedagogue. It took the man under law by hand to lead him to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we see in the first five verses, Abraham is justified by faith. Now I'm reading now verse 1. What shall we say then that Abraham, our father, is pertaining to the flesh, hath found? Now I'd like to give a translation of this that I frankly think is nearer to the thought of Paul than our translation. And listen very carefully, because all we're doing is just rearranging modifiers and phrases. Therefore, what shall we say that Abraham, our first father, has found according to the flesh? That is, by natural human effort. Now, if you'll notice that this is in line with the thought of this context, and the therefore that opens this chapter connects this argument with what he's been talking about back in the third chapter. The gospel excludes boasting and establishes the law, as we saw last time. Abraham and David confirm Paul in this thesis. 
Now he uses this idiomatic phrase, what shall we say? And Paul uses that in the argument portions of this epistle. He's come now to an argumentative portion. Therefore, that is in the first division. Paul has not attempted to prove or argue that man is a sinner. And you do not find this phrase like this, therefore, what shall we say? Now, in the last section of this epistle, which is practical, it's entirely omitted. But now he brings it forth, and he says, Abraham, our first father. <laughs> now, that reveals that the nation Israel began with Abraham. First father, I think, is a peculiar expression. It reveals the importance attached to Abraham, who was first chronologically and also first in importance. Many years ago, when I was a pastor in Nashville, I was invited by several friends that I had known before I studied for the ministry. They were Jewish friends. And they invited me to come up one evening to speak to a group of them in the YMHA, Young Men's Hebrew Association. And I went up and spoke to them on the glories of the Mosaic Law. And I was amazed to find that they stopped with Abraham. They never went back of Abraham. Quite a few of the questions reveal that. And finally, I asked them some questions. I said, don't you count Noah and Adam in the line? And they laughed and said, no. These young Jewish friends, they just said, no, we stop with Abraham. He is our first father. Now, what has he found according to the flesh? That is, that it could modify Abraham. But I think, frankly, that's what he does here. What has he found according to the flesh? Abraham has found out that Abraham's works according to the flesh did not produce boasting, but produced shame and confusion. That was Abraham's works. He had nothing to boast of. Oh, now don't misunderstand. Actually, I think Abraham was a great man and especially in that matter of Lot. He wouldn't let the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah reward him. But also Abraham didn't believe God, and he ran down to Egypt. This matter of that little Egyptian maid that he got, and the son that came from her, these are things that are not to be boasted of by Abraham. Now notice how Paul develops this. He says, for if Abraham were justified or declared righteous by works, that is, by works of the flesh, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. He can glory in self, but not before God. Now, it was assumed that Abraham had good works that counted before God. And the fact of the matter is that Abraham had many good works. But the startling thing was to discover that these good works were not the ground of salvation, but were the result of his salvation and the result of being justified by faith. You see, James and Paul did not contradict each other when James said, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered up Isaac, his son upon the altar? And that's James 2.21. Now, the works that James describes are not the works of the flesh under law, because he wasn't under law. The works of faith. He believed God, and he offered up Isaac. But did he do it? No. God stopped him and would not let him go through with it. Why? Because it was wrong. You see, Paul and James quote the same verse. He believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. James 2.23 and Romans 4.3. But James goes to the end of his life, to the time that he offered up Isaac. Now, Abraham stood on the same ground on which the weakest sinner stands. Granted that Abraham did have works in which to boast. He could never do so before God. God does not accept the works of the flesh. And the works of the flesh could not stand before his holiness. And certainly Abraham's works were tinctured. And now he quotes the Scripture. And this is verse 3. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God was counted unto him for righteousness. James quotes that, by the way, and Paul quotes it. I think in three epistles, that is, if he wrote Hebrews, and I think he did. 
Now, in Romans, Galatians, and Hebrews, Paul appeals to the Scriptures as final authority. He even personifies it here. The Scriptures is God speaking. What does the Scripture say? That's God speaking. There's no other authority which he can appeal to. It was Dr. Benjamin Warfield that made the statement, the Bible is the Word of God in such a way that whatever the Bible says, God says. And that's what Paul is saying. And friends, I wish today that more men who claim to be evangelicals really believe the Word of God and that it is the Word of God that it is God speaking and not man. Paul quotes from the Old Testament directly about 60 times in this epistle, and this is a quotation, of course, from Genesis 15, 6. He believed in the Lord. He counted it to him for righteousness. Paul says, hear what the Scripture says. God is speaking to you in the Word of God. How tremendous that is. Now, this promise is given to Abraham at a time when he raised the question with God, What wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? Genesis 15, 3. Now, God gave him no assurance other than a confirmation of the promise that his seed would be like the stars. In other words, Abraham simply believed God. He took the naked word of God at face value, and he rested in it. Newell puts it like this, and I'd like to share with you what he has to say here. Here it is. There was no honor, no merit in Abraham believing the faithful God who cannot lie. The honor was God's. When Abraham believed God, he did the one thing that a man can do without doing anything. God made the statement, the promise, and God undertook to fulfill it. Abraham believed in his heart that God told the truth, and there was no effort here. Abraham's faith was not an act, but an attitude. His heart is turned completely away from himself to God and his promise. This left God free to fulfill that promise. Faith was neither a meritorious act by Abraham nor a change of character or nature in Abraham. He simply believed God would accomplish what he had promised. In these shall all the families of the earth be blessed. How wonderful. This is a very, very, well, there's no adjective that adequately describes this. I just don't know how to describe it. Well, let me move on. Now he counted it to him. That is, he reckoned it. He put it on his account. And this is something that's very important. He imputed it. He imputed it over to him for righteousness. Now, and that's not what it is, but that's what God did. Now we're told here, and this is a great statement. Now to him that worketh is the reward, not reckon of grace, but of debt. And let me move right on to this next verse here, verse 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now, it's a general rule that a workman is paid wages for the services that he renders. A man works for so much an hour, and he's paid so much for a particular job. Now, obviously, Abraham was not a workman, for he did not earn what he received. His salvation was received on the only other basis, and that was undeserved favor by the grace of God, and he believed God. But to him that worketh not. That is, there is nothing that you can do that will merit salvation. But you believe on him. That is, on God that declares the ungodly righteous, and the only kind of people God is saving are unrighteous people. Somebody says, you mean that he doesn't save good people? Well, you want to name one? There are none righteous. God will save any man who's good. (laughs) Yes, he will. But Scripture, we've already seen, says there's none good. No, not one. Now, if you want to name somebody good, you're going to make God a liar. 
Are you prepared to do that? Then, of course, you'd have to prove your point. Now, you either believe God or you don't believe God. And that's according to God's standard, not according to my little standard or maybe your standard. This is very important. Faith is the only condition. Faith is the reckon for salvation. He reckoned it to him for salvation. And therefore, God accepts faith in lieu of works. There's no merit in faith, but it's the only way of receiving that which God freely offers. Faith honors God and secures righteousness for man. And God put down righteousness in Abraham's account to his credit. His faith counted for what it was not, a righteousness from God. This is important to see. Will you notice here? David lived under the law. Abraham didn't. The Mosaic system didn't come along till later. Now, let me read verse 6. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. David here lived under the law. But friends, David could never be saved under the law. And therefore, David describes the blessedness that God reckons righteousness without works because David had no works. David's works that he had were evil. And therefore, righteousness must be totally apart and separate from works. Righteousness must come on an entirely different principle. And verse 7, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Now, this is a direct quotation from Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2. This is one of the great penitential Psalms of David. Psalm 51 is the other. These verses are the outcome of David's great sin and his confession and acceptance which followed. Blessed, that expresses the highest level of happiness and joy. This is the greatest beatitude of all. David knew this by experience. Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven. Are you one of the blessed ones today? I'm glad to be in that company, in that number. Blessed, that expresses all that glorious, wonderful joy of sins forgiven. This is the greatest statement of all. David knew this by experience, and that God who forgives iniquities, that's lawlessness, David deliberately broke the law. He didn't do it ignorantly. May I say, he did it and he knew what he did, and he was forgiven. Now, that refers to a definite, complete remission of his sins. This means more than just remitting sin. A hard-boiled judge may under certain circumstances do that. But this speaks of the tenderness of God, the taking the sinner into his arms of love and receiving him with affection, and his sins are covered. Covered how? Because Jesus Christ died and shed his blood, my friend. And he said, Blessed is the man whom the Lord will not impute sin. That's verse 8. The Lord will not make over sin to you. David was a great sinner, and God put away his sin, as Nathan informed him. Nathan said to David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. That's 2 Samuel 12, 13. Nevertheless, David was chastened. David set his own penalty when he responded to Nathan's account of the rich man that took the poor man's ewe lamb. When Nathan told him that, he says, He shall restore the lamb fourfold. That's Second Samuel 12, 6. Four of David's children were killed. The child of Bathsheba, Ammon his firstborn, Absalom and Adonijah. Four. Sarah plagued David all the days of his life. David's guilt was not put on his account, though. Another bore it for him. Little wonder that he could say, Joyful is the man whose sin the Lord will put in no wise on him. What about you? Do you really joy today for sins forgiven? Now, he returns, that is, Paul does here to Abraham. He says, Cometh this blessing then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. 
And that was before, you see, Abraham came under the covenant that God made with him. And verse 10, how was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. God made the promise to him, and he believed God long before there was any kind of an agreement made at all other than God said, I'll do it. And Abraham believed the naked word of God. Now notice verse 11 through 13. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Now, God made him that promise, that is, to Abraham, long before circumcision was even introduced, long before anything was. He just believed God, friends. That's all. Now, verse 14. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made a none effect, because the law worketh wrath. For where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore it's of faith, that it might be by grace. Verses 14, 16a. You see, God saved Abraham by faith alone. I want you to have this impressed upon you. Abraham is justified actually by faith in the resurrection. Now I'm reading verse 19. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. There's no merit in faith itself, you see. There was nothing around Abraham that he could trust, nothing that he could feel, nothing that he could see, nothing. All he did was believe God. That's important. Verse 20 says, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. He was not double-minded. That's the whole thought here. He looked away from his circumstances to the promise. He believed the promise in spite of the fact that the circumstances nullified it. Rather, he put confidence in the promise because of the one who gave it, thus giving worship to God. You see, man was created to glorify God, but by disobedience... He did the opposite. And the only way you can glorify God, friends, is to believe him. And being fully persuaded that he had promised, he was able also to perform. Verse 21, he had confidence of what? And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. This faith is in the resurrection. Life from the dead is what was accepted from Abraham in lieu of his own righteousness, which he did not have. God declared Abraham righteous for his faith in the promise to raise up a son out of the tomb of death, that is, the womb of Sarah. God promises eternal life to those who believe that he raised up his own son from the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, the place of death. Now listen, he says, Now it was not written for this sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Verses 23 and 24. You know, the womb of Sarah was a tomb. It was a place of death. And out of that there came life. Abraham believed God. And that's what it means when Abraham, the Lord Jesus says, saw my day and rejoice. John 8:56. And notice he concludes like this. Who was delivered for our offenses? raised again for our justification. Verse 25, that is faith not only in the death of Christ, but in his resurrection. In Christ's death, he paid our debt, and in his resurrection, he took up our acquittance, is the way old Matthew Henry put it. He justifies those who believe in the death and resurrection of Christ. How wonderful this is. Have you gone that far with God? Do you believe him? Now, friends, as we come here to the fifth chapter of Romans, Paul is answering here one of the questions that would naturally come up that we've been saved by the redemption that we have in Christ. We have been spending time with that. And that redemption had been purchased by that tremendous price fought us 
upon the cross, and it delivers us from the guilt of sin, so that the sin question has been settled. That means that we'll not come up before God for judgment. It means that an eternal home is for those that have trusted Christ. Now, when I say we'll not come up before God for judgment, we're talking now about salvation. We will be judged for our works, but salvation is not in question there at all. Now, the question that is before us today is, what about the here and now? I heard a liberal preacher many years ago make this statement. He said, I do not believe in a religion of the hereafter. I believe in a religion of the here and now. Well, what about the here and now? I know that in San Francisco in the early days of the hippie movement, I was talking to one of them on a street corner, and he didn't want to hear about Christianity. He says, that's the pie in the sky, by and by, religion, and I don't care for that. And so I said to this young fellow then, you believe in getting pie here and now then, and not by and by. He said, that's right. Well, I told him, I said, it doesn't look to me like you're getting very much pie right here. And he admitted that he wasn't. And I said, well, it's tragic indeed, isn't it, to miss the pie here and now and miss it hereafter also. Well, Paul now is going to show that there are certain benefits that accrue to the believer right here and now when he trusts Christ, when he's been justified by faith in the redemption that we have in Christ. And these are benefits actually, that the world is very much concerned about today because we find that they are after these things also and would like to have them. And many people are spending a great deal of money to attain the things that are the present benefit of every believer. That doesn't mean they're all enjoying it, but God's got it on the table for you, and all you have to do is to reach over and take it. And we want to see these. Now, the benefits that we have here, the first benefit that he mentions here is in verse 1, and I want to take them up ad seriatim, let me say. That is, one after another. There are eight benefits in all. Now, let me note this first one. He says here in verse 1, "...therefore being justified by faith." And let me pause there a moment. And that means by one act of faith, the moment that we trust Christ. And then he goes on, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the Bible mentions several kinds of peace. There's world peace. And the United Nations has worked at it as the old League of Nations did. They didn't get anywhere in the past, and they're not getting anywhere today. And right now, a great many people believe that if you protest hard enough, that you're going to bring peace in the world, and that you can do it by human manipulation, uh, psychological gyrations. Well, my friend, as long as there's sin in the hearts of men, there'll never be peace in the world. Not until the Prince of Peace comes, and he'll bring peace on the earth. But that's not the kind of peace that Paul is talking about here. Then there is that peace that's known as tranquility of soul. That is the peace the Lord Jesus mentioned when he says, My peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. That's John fourteen twenty seven. That is a peace that comes to certain believers who have trusted Christ. I don't think all of us have experienced it. And it's to those who are not only resting on him, but have committed their life to him and are doing his will. I wish today that I could say to you that I've experienced this peace all the time. I'm sorry, I do not. I suppose I'm like most of you. 
I have up and down experiences. There are times when this peace floods my soul, and it's wonderful. I recognize, though, that it's available for the believer. But I find that sometimes that when we're under tension, when we're under pressure, when we're weary, that that peace somehow or another eludes us, and we do not experience it. But that's not what Paul is talking about here. Then there is the third kind of peace that Paul mentions in the fourth chapter of Philippians, the peace that passeth all understanding. Well, since it passes all understanding, I certainly don't know what it is. But the peace he's talking about here, he makes it very clear what it is. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's the peace that comes to a soul when he's trusted Christ as Savior, and he knows that God no longer has any charge against him. And he's no longer guilty. And that God now, who had to be against him, is now for him. And that he has a salvation that's permanent and eternal. That's the peace that comes because of sins forgiven. And everything's right between you and God because Of what? Well, you'll notice that again and again. Paul mentions the fact that we have peace through the blood of his cross. That means that everything is all right between our soul and God. And that's a wonderful peace. Now, this was explained to me many years ago as a young man in my teens. And the thing that was given to me by a wonderful pastor is that when man sinned in the Garden of Eden... Not only did man run away from God and found himself alienated from the life of God and actually was an enemy of God, and he had no capacity for God or no inclination to turn to God, but actually a holy God had to turn away from the sinner. And what actually happened was that when Christ died on the cross, God turned around. And now a holy God can say to a lost sinner, Come, his arms are outstretched, and he says, Come, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll rest you. This is the peace that comes, the rest, rest of redemption. We speak today of this great subject of reconciliation. Now, you don't have to do anything to reconcile God as we've seen. A great many people today think you have to shed tears. I told you about an evangelist friend, and He is great, I think, as an evangelist, but he loves to get people to weep. Well, friends, tears won't soften the heart of God. I say to this evangelist friend of mine, how many tears do you have to shed to soften God's heart? Twelve tears? Well, then, eleven won't do. You better squeeze out that last tear. But thank God it's not essential. You don't have to do anything to reconcile God. That's what Christ did for you on the cross. God is reconciled today, and the message of the gospel is, Be ye reconciled to God, 2 Corinthians 5.20. Now, when you come to him and accept his salvation, then you can experience that peace that your sins have been forgiven. Now, friends, that's a glorious, wonderful experience that can come to the child of God. Now, that's the first wonderful benefit And believe me, there are great many people that pillow their head at night that don't know what it is to have peace in their hearts. And how many weary souls that are laboring with a guilt complex, they would love to go somewhere to have the guilt removed from their souls. A Christian psychologist told me several years ago, he says the only place that you can have that guilt complex removed is at the cross of Christ. Now, the second great benefit is here in verse 2. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. Now, access means that you and I have access to God in prayer. It's wonderful to have someone to go to and to talk about yourself and about your problems and about your life and about your friends and your loved ones. And today the child of God has access to a heavenly Father who will listen to us here and who does answer our prayer. Now, that doesn't mean he answers it the way you want it answered, but he always hears you. And sometimes he's a good heavenly Father. He says, no, but if you take anything 
as his child to him in prayer, he answers it according to his wisdom and not according to our will. Now you'll notice that we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. Now we come to the third benefit, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. That's the last part of verse 2. Now, the hope that is mentioned here is the hope that the Scriptures hold out. Paul said to a young preacher by the name of Titus, he says, "...looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ." Titus 2.13. I don't think looking for the great tribulation is very much of a hope. I certainly am not looking for it, because that wouldn't be any hope at all. But to look for the Lord to come and take his church out of the world, that's a glorious hope, and it'll take place at his appearing. Now, the child of God has a hope. That means he has a future. He has something to look forward to. And you and I are living in a day when man has all the gadgets around him that are imaginable. He has all the comforts of life. And he's in an affluent society. But the interesting thing is, he has no future. James Rustin, one of the reporters and writers of New York Times, who's made the statement several years ago, that in Washington there is a feeling that the problems have so mounted up and multiplied that man can no longer solve the problems of this world. Well, actually, man is totally incapable of solving the problems of life. The Word of God, you know, goes along with that. And I suppose that is one time that the New York Times and the Bible agreed. But that's not much of a future, is it, that we have to look forward to in the world. What a dark outlook is being given to us today. And you can play the band and wave the flag all you want to, but you better face facts. There's a cancer in the body politic today. It was Bernard Shaw before he died that made this statement that he pinned his hopes on atheism and he'd found out that atheism did not solve the problems of the world. And then he made this very unusual statement. He said, you're looking at an atheist who has lost his faith. Well, I want to tell you that when an atheist loses his faith, he's lost something or probably lost nothing. He hasn't anything in the world to hold on to at all. Now, may I say to you, the world is looking for a hope. We're looking for a future. And that explains the restlessness that's throughout the world. And that, I think, explains a great deal of the movements of the present moment. And I think it's driven a great many to drug addiction and down other avenues that are dead-end streets. Why? Because they've lost hope of the future. Well, a child of God has a hope, a blessed hope, and he knows that all things are going to work together for good. He knows that nothing is going to separate him from the love of God. How wonderful that hope is today, the blessed hope of the church. Now, the fourth benefit is here in verse 3, and he says, and not only so, but we glory. Well, a better word there is we joy. Not in tribulations, unless you understand that to mean troubles. But we joy in troubles also, knowing that trouble worketh patience. That is, trouble worketh patience. Patience doesn't come automatically. And patience experience and experience hope. Now, the thing that is quite interesting, here are two words that are associated with trouble. One is joy and the other is hope. You probably ought to mention the third, that's patience. But God has to work that into us, although it's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. In other words, it takes trouble, really, to bring out the very best in the believer's life. That's the only way that God can get fruit out of the life of the believer, is by pruning the branches. And this is the method. Now, this is the opposite that the world uses. If you're in a nice situation, you have no troubles. Then you're going to have fun. And then you can also probably be a little patient. That is, if there's no reason for being patient, and then you may have a little hope as you go along. But that's not the way it is with the child of God. Actually, troubles work these things out in our lives. Now, will you notice here that he mentions the fifth and sixth, actually, that go together. He says, "...and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, 
which is given unto us. And that's verse 5. Now, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. That's the fifth one. It doesn't mean our love for God. It means God's love for us. And this love is made real by the Holy Spirit, which is given unto us. Now, this is the first time that we've had any reference to the Holy Spirit as such as a ministry here in this epistle of Romans. And it's just mentioned here in this list of the present benefits. We actually will not come to the ministry of the Holy Spirit until we get to the eighth chapter of Romans. And then he's mentioned many times, over 20. But here the Holy Spirit is given to every believer, not just to some believers, but to all believers. And he actualizes or makes real the love of God in the hearts of believers. You see, every believer gets the Holy Spirit indwelt by the Spirit of God. Even those carnal Corinthians, Paul said, What, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? And they were a carnal lot, and he called them babes in Christ. That's wonderful. I'm glad it's that way, because when I came to Christ, I got the whole ball of wax. He gave it all to me. And that's God's love for us. We need today to be conscious of the fact that God loves us. Many people today need to be assured of that in their lives, and only the Spirit of God, of course, can make that real in our lives. Now, will you notice how he explains the love of God? For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Will you notice that Christ died for the ungodly? That's where God revealed his love. Not that Christ died for good boys and girls. He died for the ungodly. Those that actually were his enemies. Those who hated him. Those are the ones that he said when they were crucifying him. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And you and I were actually in that boat. Now let me say just a word about the love of God. God saves us by love. Oh no, not love. Again, may I make a personal reference. We had a class down in San Diego on Tuesday evenings many years ago, and now we don't have a class down there. But when we did, there were some hippies that had been listening to my program for some time, and many of them were believers, and they attended the class. They filled the first two rows there every Tuesday night, and one of them one night had on his garments the word love. There was love on his cap, his funny coat, and funny trousers, and even on his funny shoes. And I asked him why he had that there. And he said, why, man, God is love. Well, I agreed with that. And he says, God saves me by his love. And I said, I disagree with that. God does not save you by his love. That seems startling to a great many folk even today. But actually, friends, God does not save you by his love. You see, God is more than love. He's holy. He's righteous. Now, God cannot open the back door of heaven and slip sinners in under the cover of darkness. And he can't let down the bars of heaven and bring the sinners in. If he does that, he's no better than a crooked judge. That's a criminal law. God has to do something for the guilt of sinners. There must be judgment, you see. But you see, God loves us, and God does love us. Let's not forget that. God loves you. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've done. God loves you. And I think it's wrong to tell little children, if you're mean, Willie, and if you do this bad thing, God won't love you. Well, the interesting thing, God will love little Willie. I don't care what little Willie does. God loved Joe Stalin. I don't know about you, I hated him. And God would have saved Joe Stalin if he'd accepted Christ on his deathbed. I would not have, but God would. God loves you. And I have news for you. You couldn't do anything to keep God from loving you. Now you can step out of the love of God. That's true. For instance, you can't keep the sun from shining, but you can get out of the sunshine. I have an ocean right now, you're not in the sunshine. But you can put up the umbrella of sin and keep the sun from shining on you. You can put up the umbrella of indifference. You can put up the umbrella of stepping out of the will of God. And all of these things will remove you from the love of God, but God still loves you. 
and you can come to him anytime you want to. But the interesting thing is God doesn't save you by love. And this fellow says to me, how does God save you? I said, well, I'd ask him for a verse to show God saves us by love. He couldn't mention any. I said, all right, let me take a verse. The Word of God says, by grace are ye saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2.8. God saves us by grace, not by love, you see. And that he gave his Son to die for you, so that... He pays the guilt of your sin, and our holy God now can save you if you come his way. You'll have to come his way. This idea today, you can come your way. This isn't your universe. It's his universe. You and I don't make the rules. He makes the rules. And he says, no man cometh to the Father but by me. Now notice what he says in verse 7. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. Now, do you know any folk who would die for you? Could you put on the fingers of one hand those who would be willing to die for you? By the way, could you put on one finger those that love you enough to die for you? Well, you certainly could put it on one finger because God loves you enough to send his son to die for you. And if it was necessary, he'd appear right now, to die for you again if it would take that to save you. He loves you that much. Verse 8, But God commendeth his love toward us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For you and for me, that's where God revealed his love. And God doesn't save us, beloved. He now saves us by grace because the guilt of sin has been removed by the death of Christ, and he can hold out his arms to save you today. Let me amplify this today. God so loved the world that did he save the world? No, he doesn't save, beloved. He did this. God so loved the world he gave his son to die. Couldn't ask him to do any more than that because you and I are sinners. But whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Have you accepted his invitation? He loves you. But he doesn't save you till you trust Christ. We come in verse 9 to the seventh benefit, and that's deliverance from the great tribulation. Notice what he says. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Now, the wrath that is mentioned here is the wrath that the Scripture speaks of. The great day of his wrath is come. The prophet Zephaniah used that term in Zephaniah 1.14. What is the great day of wrath? Well, the great day of wrath that is coming, the Lord Jesus called it the great tribulation. And he tells the believer here that he is saved from wrath. I've been saved from the penalty of sin. And he's constantly saving us today from the power of sin. But he's going to save us in the future from the presence of sin. And that means that every believer will go out at the rapture and will go out not because he's worthy, because he's not worthy, but because he's been saved by the grace of God. And he'll be taken out by the grace of God. We're saved by grace. We live by the grace of God. And not 10,000, but 10 million years from today, we'll be in heaven by the grace of God. We are saved from wrath through him. And now notice verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. You see, he died down here to save us. He lives up yonder to keep us saved. Now he mentions the eighth benefit here in verse 11. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we've received not the atonement, but the reconciliation. Now we just joy in God. I think this is one of the most wonderful statements that we have in this section. It just means right now, wherever you are, whatever your problems are, My friend, you can just joy, that is, rejoice in God. Just think of it. You can rejoice that he's who he is. 
that he lives. We can rejoice that he's provided a salvation for us, that he's willing to save us sinners and bring us into his presence, and he's worked out a plan because of his love for us. Now, isn't that enough to make you rejoice? That's a benefit. Oh, the child of God should have joy in his heart. Now, he doesn't have to go around smiling like a Cheshire cat, but he sure ought to have joy in his heart. I love that song that's out today. It's a rather new song. Let's just praise the Lord. We have that on a cassette tape, and at night sometimes after we get in bed, my wife and I just play it. Let's just praise the Lord. Now, these are the eight benefits that Paul mentions here. Now we come to this next section here in Romans, beginning at verse 12 of chapter 5, and that's sanctification of the saint. And that'll take us through the eighth chapter. Now, will you notice as we come here, this is a new section in the epistle to the Romans. You remember the first section had to do with the subject of sin. Then salvation was the subject. And we have seen the salvation of the sinner. Now we're coming to the sanctification of the saint because God in salvation only declares the sinner righteous. Nothing has happened inside of the individual to make him better. But God is going to make him better. And so we find that in sanctification, we have a work of God. Whereas in salvation, it was an act of God. Now in this section we're coming to, I've labeled potential sanctification. That's the remainder of chapter 5. We have here a subject that I think you'll find it difficult. You'll find it difficult in two ways. I find it difficult to understand. I find it difficult to accept. This is probably the hardest doctrine for any Christian, especially having heard it for the first time, to accept it and to believe it. Now, in potential sanctification, here in this fifth chapter, we have what is known as the federal headship of Adam and Christ. I want to talk about that for just a moment. And I recognize I'm getting theological now, but let's notice the mechanics of the rest of the chapter. In verses 12 through 14, you have the headship of Adam. Death and sin came through him. Then you have the headship of Christ. And life and righteousness came through him. That's verses 15 and 17. Then you have finally, in this chapter, the offense of Adam versus the righteousness of Christ. And that's in verses 18 through 21. All right, now let's look at this question of the headship of Adam. Through him came to the race sin and death. And I'd like to read verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Now I trust you have our notes and outlines of Romans, and better still, I hope many of you felt that you'd like to have part in supporting our program, and you've sent for our first volume on reasoning through Romans. And I have in this volume, through this section, my own translation of the verses that we're considering. That is where we think that by translating we can bring out the meaning a little bit better. Now, don't misunderstand me. I do not recommend this translation at all. The fact of the matter is, we call it here in Southern California, the Magiacus Ad Absurdum translation. Nobody ought to use it. But now listen to it as we have it here, and I think that probably we can widen out our understanding of this section. On this account, that is the plan of salvation for all by one Redeemer, just as through one man's sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread throughout upon all men on the ground of the fact that all sin. Now we need to understand here that the sin we're talking about is not the sin that you and I commit that brings death. It's the sin of Adam, that first sin of Adam. Not his second one or his third one, his fourth one, but that first sin. Disobedience in the Garden of Eden brought death upon all of his progeny, all of his offspring. 
Now, that brings me back to consider something that's very important, and that is the fact that you and I are sinners, as we said, in four different ways. And that means that you and I are sinners because we commit acts of sin. But we're sinners by nature because sin doesn't make us sinners, but we sin because we are sinners. We have that nature. And then we have seen already we're under sin. We're in the state of sin. God has declared the entire human family under sin. But you and I are also sinners by imputation. Now, that is, Adam acted for the human race. That means he was the head of it. And he acted for the human race. And it's on the basis of that federal headship of Adam that now God is able through the federal headship of Christ to save those that will trust Christ. Well, I reckon that this is a little... Difficult, but let's stick with it. Let's hang in there. Now, this is what the theologians have labeled the federal headship. Let me say just a word about it and see if we can't probably understand it. Adam and Christ are representatives of the human race. Adam is the natural head of the human race. And by the way, I accept that. I saw a bumper sticker that interests me a great deal. I liked it. It says... My ancestors were human. Sorry about yours. (laughs) And may I say that this lays in the dust any idea that you can be a Christian and believe in the Word of God today and also accept evolution. Adam is the head of the human family. That's what Paul is saying here. He's the natural head. And his one act of disobedience plunged his entire offspring into sin. We're all made sinners by Adam's sins. Now, this doesn't mean that we have a sinful nature inherited from Adam. Now, that's true. I got a sinful nature from my father, and he from his father, and on back. And I passed that on to my child. And now I have two grandchildren. And that first one was such a wonderful little fella. I was beginning to think that maybe there wasn't any such thing as the total depravity of man. But that little fella grew up. And I've got another one. He's red-headed. And boy, does he have a temper. And I want to say to you that I now believe in the total depravity of man again because I've seen a manifestation in those two little fellas of something that they got from their grandmother, I think. But may I say to you that you and I have a sinful nature. But that sin of Adam was made over to us also, and we can prove it. Now, this doesn't mean that we're all either guilty of a sinful act. We are, but that's not what he's talking about here. When he says all have sinned, we've sinned in Adam. It does mean that we're so vitally connected with the first father of the human race that before we even had a human nature or had committed a sin, even before we were born, we were sinners in Adam. Now, maybe you don't like that, but that's the way God has put it. We're just like the Scripture has An illustration of that. You remember, we're told that Levi paid tithes to Melchizedek long before he was born. How'd he do it? Well, the writer to the Hebrews says in Hebrews 7, 9, And as I may so say, Levi also who receiveth tithes paid tithes in Abraham. Now, Adam's sin, therefore, is imputed unto us. What Adam did, we did. Now, God could put all of us in a Garden of Eden after Adam had sinned, and we would have had a sinful nature. Do you think that we could have done any better in the Garden of Eden with a sinful nature than Adam did without a sinful nature? I don't think so. He disobeyed God. His one act of disobedience made us all that. Now, somebody says, I don't like that. You don't like that? Well, let me illustrate that again by something that you do accept, I believe. For instance, my grandfather lived in North Island. He was Scottish, and they fought back in his day. He didn't like it, so he emigrated to this country. He left Northern Ireland. He came to the United States, settled first in Georgia. Now what my grandfather did, I did. When he left Northern Ireland, I left Northern Ireland. And I thank God he left, friends. I sure appreciate what Grandpa did for me. Now, if you want to know the truth, when he came to this country... What he did, I did. I was in him. And the reason that I'm born in this country is because of what he has done. In that way, Adam's sin is imputed to us. 
Now we are already seen that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us by the death of Christ. Christ is the head of a new race, a new redeemed man, and the church is his body, a new creation. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the blood. The church is a new creation. It's a new race. And now this is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 45 and then 47, so it's written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Notice, the first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Now, there will not be a third Adam, for Christ is the last Adam. There will be third, fourth, and myriads of men because Christ is the second man. But he's not the second Adam. He's the last Adam. He's the head of a new race. Now, that is something we want to say that's preliminary. And as you go through this section, you'll notice an expression that is very meaningful. It is much more. What he's going to say is, we have much more in Christ than we lost in Adam. And that expression was way back in verse 9, much more than being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Verse 10, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now, there's a great deal of much more in this section here. Now, let's look at this again. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 and 22. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Now, death came by Adam, and if you want proof, that the first sin of Adam was a representative act. And I said a moment ago that we could prove it, that one act of Adam brought death to the human family. You say, I thought my sin did it. Oh, no. Have you ever stopped to think of why a little infant will die and a little infant hasn't committed a sin? That is a sinful act. Well, that little infant belongs to the race of Adam. In Adam all die. You see, God didn't intend man to die. God had something better in store for man and does today. Now, with that thought in mind, let's move into this section. In verse 13, I read, For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there's no law. Now, that is from Adam to Moses, sin was in the world. But at that time, sin was not a transgression. It was merely rebellion against God. And I think this is the reason God did not exact the death penalty from Cain when he murdered his brother. I can't think of a deed more dastardly than that. But God had not said, Thou shalt not kill. And actually, God put a mark on Cain to protect him. And you find that a little later on that one of the sons of Cain, Lamech, tells why he killed a man. He says, I've slain a man to my wounding, a young man to my hurt. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech, seventy and sevenfold. You see, Lamech had a reason. And then that generation that was destroyed at the flood, it was saturated with sin. They were incurable, incorrigible. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's in Genesis 6, 5. But not one of them broke the Ten Commandments, because there wasn't any Ten Commandments then. But they were judged because they were sinners. And friends, that's the reason whether you've heard the gospel or not. And that answers the question about the heathen today that haven't heard. The whole question is that we belong to a lost race. That's difficult for you and me to accept. But you and I have been born into a lost race. We're not a lovely people. We're not the product of evolution onward and upward forever. And everything is getting better. It's not. You and I belong to a lost race, and we need to be redeemed. Even the very thought life of man is alienated from God. And somebody says, well, I think that God then today is obligated to save all of us. No, he's not. Suppose that you could go down to an old marshy lake covered with scum, and you take a turtle out of there, and there are hundreds of turtles in that lake, and you teach this turtle to fly. And this turtle goes down and says to the other turtles, wouldn't you like to learn to fly? I think they'd laugh at the turtle. They'd say, no, we like it down here. We don't want to fly. And that's the condition of lost man today. Men don't want to be saved. That's not the condition of man. 
Men are lost, alienated from God. Now, that's a great truth that's so difficult for it to soak in the minds of all of us because we have that lost nature. We just love to think that we're wonderful people and we're not friends. Now, notice verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Now, what Paul is doing here, he personifies death. And he speaks of the fact that death reigned like a king from Adam to Moses. But they hadn't broken the Ten Commandments. They weren't given, you see. It was not transgression, but man was a sinner. Now, actually, death is used in a threefold way in Scripture. That's what is known as physical death. That refers only to the body. And it means a separation of the spirit from the body. And this death comes because of Adam's sin. Now, there's spiritual death. That's separation from and rebellion against God. And we inherit this nature from Adam. We're alienated from God. We're dead in trespasses and sins. That's the picture that Scripture presents. The Lord Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. He that heareth my word, though he were dead. And that used to disturb me. How could he be dead in here? Well, they're spiritually dead. That is separated from God. Then eternal death. That's the second death the Scripture speaks of. And that's eternal separation from God. And unless man is redeemed, this inevitably follows. And I should say this is the third now, Adam is definitely here declared to be a type of Christ, who is the figure, as I have it. He's the type of him who was to come. That is, Adam is a type of Christ, and so said you. Now, listen to verse 15. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For it, through the offense of one, many be dead. Now, listen to this. Much more. You get much more in Christ. Much more, the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto men. Now he's presenting here, you see, the headship of Christ. We have much more in Christ, and we today are looking forward to something more wonderful than the Garden of Eden. We're told in Hebrews 11:13, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that there were strangers and pilgrims in the earth. What a wonderful thing. Verse 16, and not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification." Now, I recognize this is a difficult passage of Scripture. This is one of those very difficult passages. Now, all this section simply means this. One transgression plunged the race into sin. One act of obedience and the death of Christ upon the cross makes it possible for lost man to be saved. And he presents to us, therefore, actually here, two kingdoms. And in verse 18... I read, Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men under justification of life. Now, verse 19, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous." These are the two kingdoms that are presented to us. There is the kingdom of death. That's Adam's. We belong to that. And Adam all died. Then there is that one of life, the Lamb's book of life. Are you written in it? And these are the two kingdoms. Death reigns over one, Christ over the other. He is the one that gives life today. Notice verse 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And you notice, when God gave the law, he gave with it a sacrificial system. And then later on, Christ came to fulfill that part of it, too. In other words, God has given to the human race, a lost race, an opportunity to be delivered from the guilt of sins and not the nature of sin. Now, you and I will have that until we die. Now, will you notice that we come to the last verse of this very difficult section, verse 21. That as sin hath reigned unto death. You see, 
You and I are living in a world today where sin reigns. You want to know who's the king of the earth today? Satan is the prince. He's the one that goes up and down the earth seeking whom he may devour. That's Peter 5, 8. Sin hath reigned unto death, and the cemeteries are still being filled because of that. Now, he says, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. And he's calling out a people today, out of a lost race, and he's teaching turtles to fly if they want to. That's no reflection on the turtles that don't want to because it's their nature. They're alienated. Man is alienated from God, and that's our nature. Now, God offers salvation to a lost race. This is the tremendous subject of imputation of sin, and it's actually potential sanctification. It's on this foundation that God now will seek not only to save man from the guilt of sin, but to make mankind that trusts him free, to deliver them that they can live from God. 